Financial markets in Asia have mostly steadied out today after a week where the coronavirus outbreak triggered huge losses around the world. The number of new cases reported by China has dropped sharply, but the epidemic is still spreading rapidly in other countries. The total number of infections around the world now exceeds 89,000 people. More than 3,000 have died. Indonesia and several other countries are reporting their first cases. Officials in Italy, the worst hit country in Europe, said the number of people in infected with the virus jumped by 50% to nearly 1,700. Not a tourist in sight. The canals of Venice without its famous gondolas. No sound of fans cheering in Milan's football stadium either. Across Italy, five major matches have been postponed due to the coronavirus. As new infections climb dramatically in Europe's worst hit country, the Italian government is imposing more drastic measures. Army checkpoints control quarantine areas in some regions, and emergency aid has been promised to the sectors hardest hit by the rapid spread of the virus. In France, tourists line up outside the world's most visited museum, the Louvre, on Sunday, in vain. They were not allowed in the building after the museum staff voted to keep its doors shut due to fears of contamination from the flow of tourists. Uh, I want to go to see the Mona Lisa, the, the painting, but unfortunately it's closed, so I'm a bit disappointed. The French government has banned gatherings of more than 5,000 people closing down trade fairs and large sporting events. Even though a half marathon in Paris was officially called off, hundreds of runners defied the ban and ran the full course. I'd signed up to take part in the marathon and since I had nothing to do this morning, I thought I might as well go and run. It was my goal and if I can do it, why not? We have to stop all this paranoia with what's happening. We have to keep things in perspective. In recent days, the US, Australia and Thailand have reported the first deaths on their soil. But with more than 50 deaths, Iran has the world's highest toll outside of China. The epidemic is impacting businesses and daily life and shaking the country's already struggling economy. People are panicked a little and the stress has led to a drop in sales. People have also become more hygiene obsessed and buy less food from bakeries restaurants and caterers. As markets around the globe take a hit, some countries are more vulnerable than others. Let's talk about the economic consequences now with Gerhard Elfers from DW Business. Hi, Gerhard. That's for me. Last week was pretty bad for the global markets. How, what's the picture like today? Well, it's, it's a bit better today. Uh, Asian markets uh, have uh, recovered. Um, also, European markets have uh, opened slightly up. The FTSE is up uh, 2%. Uh, so, uh, but it was a slaughter last week. Five trillion US dollars have been wiped off. Uh, shares. That's 5,000 billion US dollars. It's, it's quite unbelievable. And uh, it's, it's not going to be the end of it. Uh, there's a, a study out. Uh, it says that if the, this pandemic lasts uh, another six months, which is quite, quite likely, uh, it will wipe $1.1 trillion off global GDP growth. So uh, it is pretty serious, even though there's a slight recovery today. Okay, so what are governments and central banks uh, doing to offset these losses? Well, they've just only begun to uh, put things into motion. And there's not so much uh, uh, they can do because it's mainly a supply chain issue that is uh, hitting the uh, hitting world trade at the moment. China is the world's wor workshop. There's hardly any big company that does not manufacture something in China, gets parts from China, raw materials uh, from China. So that uh, uh, makes it difficult. One striking, rather striking example, Jaguar Land Rover in the UK, the car maker, has actually sent employees by plane to China to hand carry parts back to Britain uh, because wow. the supply chain uh, is so disrupted. And what governments uh, can do, of course, Germany has uh, said it will uh, make money available. Germany has a big surplus, so it is rich enough to do that to help the economy. Italy is slightly different. They have said they put 3.6 billion 
uh, to the side to help the uh, uh, Italian companies that are affected, but they, uh, Italy doesn't have that much money anyway. So it's slightly uh, different. And central banks, of course, can do something. They can make money cheaper. They can lower interest rates. But since it's a supply side issue, not a demand side issue, cheap money doesn't really help that much. So where do you see things going from here? Well, we're going to see uh, more uh, earthquakes, if you will, uh, economic earthquakes. And uh, uh, while people stop traveling, the airline, airlines uh, are um, in, in trouble, the oil price is dropping because demand is, uh, is low. So there's a chain reaction that's, that's going on that uh, we're going to have to report on quite a lot in the next couple of months, I think. And you'll be taking a closer look at that coming up on DW Business right after this show. Gerhard mm -hmm. Alvers with us. Thank you. Well, the European Union has been presenting its response to the coronavirus crisis. And DW's Terry Schulz is following that story for us in Brussels. Hi, Terry. Good to see you. Uh, there has been a press conference. What has been announced? The European Commission very much wants to give the appearance that while they're taking the corona infections very seriously, everything that can be under control is under control. So European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen was flanked by five commissioners from the economy, from home affairs, crisis response, transport and health. And each one of them spoke to their own particular expertise. But they said that the response overall is being coordinated under three main pillars. And one is medical, one is mobility and one is the economy. Now, it's important to point out that each member state has its own crisis response and each one of them makes their own decisions. So uh, the commission is saying, hey, count, us a, count on us for a certain amount of, of coordination, but we don't make the decisions for member states. They also wanted to update uh, the figures on infections. There are now 2,100, 2,100 confirmed cases across 18 member states and 38 deaths. Terry, what is at stake here for the EU? The economics commissioner, Paolo Gentiloni, said that the stakes are very high economically. He said that early expectations that there would be a fast drop um, followed by a fast recovery may have been too optimistic because we certainly don't know that we've seen the end of it yet, that uh, that there's any containment um, in sight yet. And, of course, he spoke about uh, the fact that uh, when China is suffering something like this, of course it impacts the European Union. And that's not the only place. You have a lot of very worried citizens. And each commissioner said in their own way, don't panic. Um, but you have a lot of travelers who are either having their flights canceled or canceled canceling the flights themselves, and there are a lot of questions about what kind of compensation might be uh, might be available, and it looks like this is going to be one of those sort of acts of God situations where you're not going to get compensation. So there were a lot of questions at this press conference that went on uh, almost an hour, and there will be many more questions to come, but the main message right now is don't panic. We've got our, our hand, we've got control of, of everything that can be under control, and we're watching very carefully. And there is now a new website where uh, uh, people can can get all of the up-to-date information from the European Commission. Correspondent Terry Schultz reporting there for us from Brussels. Terry, good to talk to you. Schools in Japan have shut down to contain the spread of the coronavirus. It's a precautionary measure announced by Prime Minister Shinzo Abe last week. The decision affects some 12.8 million students across nearly 35,000 schools around the country. The schools are meant to remain shut until spring holidays that begin in late March. Japan has so far reported a little more than 200 cases of COVID-19, the disease caused by the new strain of coronavirus. School's out for millions of Japanese children. But while the youngsters get an extended holiday, many parents are faced with a logistical nightmare. They need to make alternative childcare arrangements while the schools are shut. I think companies need to be flexible in dealing with the situation. I really didn't think that the virus would infect so many people. It's good to close the schools. But a lot of parents work today, so they have to take some time off. I feel sorry for them. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe said the drastic measure was necessary after a meeting with the country's coronavirus task force on Thursday. 
There are many efforts being made to stop the spread of infection among children in various regions, and the next one or two weeks are crucial. The announcement took local government and health officials by surprise. They've been scrambling to come up with guidelines to implement the closures. And some politicians have warned that the risks posed by shutting schools also need to be considered. The mayor of Chiba, Toshihito Komage, tweeted, what about parents and occupations that support society? How will they manage? Society could collapse. But with opinion polls showing public dissatisfaction with Abe's handling of the coronavirus outbreak, it appears the Prime Minister is betting on school closures as an effective strategy to bring new infections under control. For more, joining me from Tokyo is journalist Michael Penn. Michael, thanks for being with us. The first day of the school shutdown, how has it been? Uh, it's been a little chaotic. Uh, the uh, lots of companies and uh, lots of their children are are scrambling to to try to deal with a situation that was uh, unforeseen until just a couple of days ago. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, for the kids, uh, you know, they may or may not be happy to be out of school, but uh, the uh, the parents, who all, many of them who depended on their kids being at school so that they could go to work. Uh, many of them are, are in considerable trouble uh, because they have to take time off from work or to figure out how to do teleworking. And this is not just, you know, one or two people in the office. It's, it's essentially everybody who has kids, so and all at the same time. So it's been uh, a major adjustment, uh, and, uh, you know, they're, they're still going to need time to figure out how it's going to work. So has it basically just been left to the parents and to the other relatives of the children to try and figure out this shutdown? Is the government assisting in any way? Uh, essentially, uh, Prime Minister Abe just requested that all of the schools close down. And uh, not every school, not every prefecture uh, actually obeyed his request. Uh, there is, for example, Shimane Prefecture in Western Japan, which uh, completely ignored the prime minister's uh, uh, request. But, uh, and there are other schools as well. But yes, essentially, it's been left to uh, all the various school boards and all the various local governments and all the various companies and all the various individual parents to figure out how to adapt to this uh, to this issue. The, the government uh, did not do any particular preparation, and the decision was made uh, even without the uh, input of the education ministry. So, uh, yeah, everybody was kept flat-footed, and they're just trying to uh, figure, out, uh, figure out as they go along. And there has been a fair bit of criticism, hasn't there, Michael, uh, about the government's decision, especially considering that this is a government and a prime minister that is facing fire and criticism over the response to the coronavirus outbreak. Was this a political move? Uh, in fact, the prime minister himself has pretty much admitted that uh, in parliamentary debate today, uh, he was uh, cornered by opposition parties who said, who are trying to find out how he made this decision. And the prime minister was forced to admit that, uh, in fact, uh, he made the decision without consulting any experts. And uh, so uh, it was basically Prime Minister Abe's own political decision to do this, personal, without even many of his own staff members uh, on board with it. And uh, so... You know, the, the government was being criticized for being too lax in its handling of, uh, for example, the uh, the uh, Diamond Princess issue and other uh, parts of the infection. And now they kind of swung from going from what might have been too lax to, to possibly too harsh. And uh, the government is in particular crisis right now, kind of political crisis, which the Abe right. administration has not seen in its seven years in power. Michael Penn joining us from Tokyo. Thank you very much for that. Thank you.